this GameCube has seen better days. It's a DAL001 model, which has the digital AV port affording 480p output for games that support it. But what's wrong with this cube? Issue number one, the dang game lid is stuck open. More accurately, the button for it is stuck, so the latch that would normally hold the lid closed is jammed. Issue number two, when I power it on, I'm prompted to reset the internal clock, which means we either have a dead battery or a bad connection to it. Issue number three, the console isn't reading the game. In fact, it doesn't spin up the disc at all. These seem to be all the problems, since otherwise the console powers on, displays to the TV, and responds to controller inputs. Once we get those issues taken care of, we can turn that frown upside down. <laughs> I couldn't resist. Please forgive me. Now that all the issues are diagnosed, let's get into the repairs. We'll start by tackling the disc read error, since that has potential to be the most challenging. Removing the shell requires a game bit driver and unthreading the four screws along the corners. After which, the shell just pulls right off. I want to focus on this switch here, because it looks suspicious. That does not seem normal. What's the purpose of this switch, you ask? Well, when you close the lid, this plastic arm activates it and tells the console that the game lid is closed. If the switch is broken, the cube will always think the lid is open and never spin the game disc. This is a momentary on switch, so when we press the levers and let go, they should return back to their initial open position. That isn't happening here, which tells us right away it's pretty likely defective. We'll get a closer look by pulling the back plate, unplugging this connector, and removing a single screw to release the switchboard. It's very dirty, so I'll clean it up a bit with a toothbrush. There's some noticeable corrosion on the underside of the switch there, so yeah, pretty sure it's busted. When the game lid closes and hits this switch, all it does is close the circuit between these two outside pins, which means we can easily bypass it by bridging them with solder, which is exactly what I'm doing now. Don't worry about the center pin, it's not tied to anything. After cleaning the flux with alcohol, here's what it looks like. Now we'll reinstall the connector and screw for the switchboard and loosely piece the shell back together for a quick test. It looks like it's gonna read it. Yes. Did you insert a memory card? Shorting out that switch like I did will get you by in a pinch and even long term, but it's a potential safety issue, what with the laser being exposed and all and you'll have to power off the system to change out a disc. Not a big deal, but it's just different from normal operation. You can get a new switchboard online, and I'd recommend replacement if yours has gone bad. I have a working one handy from a donor GameCube that had a damaged motherboard. I'll make the replacement off camera, since we've already shown that process, and we can move on to the next fix. And that's the stuck lid button. This should be pretty straightforward, and it's almost always dirt and gunk jamming up the button mechanism that causes this problem. There's two screws to remove, which allows us to take out the latch and the spring. The button has locking tabs we can pinch towards the center, and it's a little hung up in there, so we'll use a tweezers to push it the rest of the way through. Then we'll pull the spring out of the latch and just clean everything thoroughly with rubbing alcohol. Same story on the shell. We want to clean every surface that the button and latch are going to interact with. And that's really all there is to it. When things have dried off, we can put the spring back in the latch and fit it back in place. Fasten it down in both locations and pop the button back in. And it's fixed. When things are clean, they work better. So like I said, pretty straightforward. But while I'm here, I'm going to swap out all these buttons with some nicer ones from that donor GameCube I mentioned earlier. Each button is removed in the same way with those two locking tabs on opposite ends. So we'll pop in the nice ones, admire the beauty, and move on to the next fix. Back inside the GameCube, we were suspicious of a dead internal battery, and that's right here. So let's test it. With the multimeter, we're getting just under 0.9 volts when we should be getting 3. That battery is pretty dead. We should replace it. To do that, we can pivot out the front plate and then pull the cable. Two screws to separate the board from the plate, and there it is. But what's that? That first pin on this cable is not looking so good. It looks a bit corroded, so we'll try to clean it up using alcohol and a pencil eraser. I wasn't seeing the results I would have liked here and decided to sand it down a bit with a knife edge. 
Ultimately, I removed the corroded surface finish, but the upper two pins are now down to bare copper, which is not ideal. If this were a polyimid cable, I would attempt to refinish it with solder, but this cheap blue plastic would immediately melt if I tried that. On the console end, we can see the corresponding connector pin also has corrosion at the land as well as inside the connector. So I clean that up as well, also needing to scrape at it a bit off camera. And eventually, I have the underlying metal revealed, and I think we're going to be able to make this work. The questionable pin actually ties to the positive terminal on the battery, and we'll need to make sure we test it after we get that swapped out. So now we'll desolder the old dead battery, and it drops out without much fuss. My replacement is a CR2025 cell that I had handy from some previous repair work. Ideally, you'd use a CR2032. These battery types are interchangeable, but the 2025 has roughly 30% less capacity in terms of amp hours. Hence, you'd want to use the 2032 for the best longevity. To install this battery, I need to slightly trim the negative pin so it fits in the slot on the board. Also doing some bending of the pins as I went along, but getting this soldered in is still a fairly quick process. Now we're at 3.1 volts, and that is what we like to see. With that, we can reinstall the plate using the two screws, and plug the board back into the cube. I'm getting ahead of myself now because I forgot to test the battery connection, and it turns out it was discontinuous. In other words, no good. That questionable pin I was prettying up earlier was the culprit, and I assume too much metal had been lost from the corrosion and my cleaning efforts between the cable and the connector, so they weren't making contact. I thought giving it a slight amount more pressure at the interface could solve this. So I cut a piece of printer paper, which is three thousandths of an inch thick, and placed it in the problem area of the connector before plugging the cable back in. It might seem silly, but if it works, it works. So let's see what the meter says. It was hard to get a good camera angle here, but I'm putting one probe on the positive terminal of the battery, and the other is going to the connector land for that first pin in question. That beep means we have continuity in the circuit. In other words, that piece of paper solved the dilemma, so I trim it a bit shorter and get the plate back in place. You can hardly even tell it's there. Now I have the console loosely pieced back together again just so I can set the clock with the current year and leave it unplugged for a while to make sure the battery is working. All that's left to do now is button this up and do a final test. Alright, let's run through each issue again with the fixes in place. I've had this unplugged for a few days to ensure there's no residual capacitor charge maintaining the system clock, since we want to know whether the new battery works and has a stable connection. Good news! It looks like the system remembered the year that I set earlier, so the battery swap with that paper strip to shore up the connection was a success. I need to fix the month, day, and time, but I'll do that off camera. Next up, putting in a game reveals we can open and close the lid properly without anything binding up, so cleaning out that mechanism was another success. Last thing is whether we can play the game. And there it is. Did you insert a memory card? Since I used that paper shim for the battery board connection, I was a little worried about the controller ports since they are also on that board. A quick test shows that each controller port responds to input without issue, so we're good here. At this point, I'd say we have full confirmation that this cube is once again operating normally, and that is just fantastic to see. Go check out my other videos for more repairs like this one. If you have an issue with a console or a handheld, there's a good chance I've already fixed it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video.